Pomegranates of wondrous Greece, oranges of sultry Florida, peaches of sleepy Georgia. I suck! Plums, apricots, the juices running, apples, happy with New England frost, mangoes, a burst with erotic jungle lands. I suck! Orange melons, chartreuse honeydews, dripping nectarines of dawn, grapefruits tart with Paris laughter. I suck! Ambrosia of Olympus when I suck your lips. Welcome to the two month review of the weekly podcast brought to you by Open Letter at 3% that always starts out with a piece of poetry. I am Chad Post from Open Letter Books, joined as always by Brian Wood, author of Joy Time Killbox. I also you suck. You suck. I suck. And we have a special guest this week, Tom Flynn, who is known right now. I'm going to say that you are the pod, like one of the co hosts of Lost in Redonda, which is a podcast, a book podcast that started not too very long ago, and we'll let you talk about more in a second, but also is known for his exploits as a bookseller in Chicago and as a uh, marketing person for and other stories here in the U.S. So we are reading Mulligan Stew by Gilbert Sorrentino this this season, um, and we are going up through page one or 261 um, in the new edition this week, and that poem, I Suck! is part of what we start off with is uh, Lorna Flambeau's poetry, just to give everyone a context. But before we get into the book, of which this section is absolutely wild, I'm going to take a second to see how you all are doing. I've had a crazy morning because an author, Jan Fossa, that I was the first English editor to acquire and to publish at Delki Archive back in 2006. In fact, Melancholy, the book that that kicked off his career and the one that I, that I signed on, was the last book to come out from Delki before I left. So and he won, great. We have other books from from him at Delki that we recently published, like Trilogy, and Fitzcarraldo had, and Transit do the Septology and the new book, A Shining. And congrats to Jan Fossa overall. I don't know if you guys want to have any opinions on the Nobel Prize situation. Uh, the the Nobel is always an interesting one. I mean, it's you know famously as well known for the people it misses as the ones that it chooses to celebrate. It's had some weird things over the past few years, but it's cool. And also, I mean, I think, I think in this particular case, you've got three really great presses that are making sure that this author is celebrated and widely available in English. And, you know, that's, I, I don't know, that, that matters. I mean, I've, you know, as you mentioned, as I've been a bookseller for a long time. I'm sorry. Hi, this is Tom Flynn talking. I should probably identify my voice first in case you're listening to this just in an audio form. Just um, and just for the first time ever, and you've never heard me or Brian talk. You just jumped yeah. in on, on episode twenty point four. Yeah, absolutely. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I just think I think it's very neat when uh, and very important to uh, book culture. Um, when authors are available when the Nobel comes out. It's a really big, it's one of the few big media moments uh, for literature in the worldwide and maybe specifically Western calendar. Um, so having having Dalkey, having Transit, having Fitzcarraldo all um, publishing and behind this author, oh, it, it makes a difference. It, it makes it, in some ways it makes it feel bigger and matter more or at least have the opportunity to have an impact um so that's 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 never not a good thing yeah brian do you know fasa not at all not at all not i don't know that you I, you might actually really like him uh, the early books like trilogy in particular melancholy is fun we, i really liked from the sample which came um via Damien Searles, who also has translated most of FASA and should get a shout out as well into English. But it came from him. He had been like a co-translator, like sort of a more editorial role on the sample. Like the looping nature of the elliptical nature of the writing mixed with like the general deterioration of the protagonist's mind is what like 
made it a Delkey book for me and why we published it. But Trilogy, which we just redid as a Delkey Essential, one of the first Delkey Essentials, in fact, um, that book I think is probably my favorite in that it's three novellas, very short, that function almost like Beckett plays and the structure and way that it's like locks together and, and twists each time, I think is really genius. Um, and if, so if anyone's looking for a place to start, I would recommend Trilogy first. So as a talent recruiter and like a, let's, let's, let's go with a baseball analogy. Let's say you're a scout and you're like, oh, there's a four tool prospect there. Did you like know what you had when you had it? Or if you throw a uh, dart board, you're going to hit one, one of these days. The first, um, with the, with melancholy, no, that was just like, here's this like relatively young author. This was in 2004 that we would have signed the book on. It came out in 2006. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe it was a little bit later than that, but 2004, 2005, that the book gets signed on. And he, that's like 18 years ago, right? So he's not super old even now. So he's still like a relatively young author established in Norway, mostly for his plays and dramatic work. Um, and then that book is like a particularly interesting, perfect sort of Delkey book that I did all the pre-press for. And there's a Melancholy 2 as well, a shorter sort of sequel. Did a lot of the pre-pub for, but wasn't there to shepherd it into the larger audience. But over the years that John O'Brien remained friends with Fossa and like continued publishing him, as he has a lot of like Boathouse, Morning and Evening, Alyssa at the Fire, all these books that are relatively slim volumes that all kind of it lock around the same atmosphere and tone and sort of same type of character, if not the same character exactly. And then more recently, the Septology comes out, which is basically kind of a recounting. It brings together almost all the earlier books into a space in which it talks about like uh, the soul and life and art and various other like heavier general European con con uh, uh, like concerns. But like after a few books came out, it was clear that he was going to win the Nobel Prize at some point in time. It felt very inevitable for probably the past like six, seven years. Um, and so at some point it was like, yeah, we know what we have uh, because it's going to happen. He has certain certain traits like that Europeanness, the very deep concern with like the art and things. And it is sort of against the mold in the fact that it is a white European that is whose books are very like self-reflective. Um, and sort of the that that persona is on the page writ large. Um, and it's at a time in which we're sort of like as a culture trend away from that sort of that sort of modality. But nevertheless, it is a very Nobel Prize type of author. I, I'm wondering, like you mentioned that for the last few years it's been thought that, you know, there's an inevitability to it, but I didn't see him as being one of the betting odds favorites this time. He was, um, he was second. Oh, was he? Okay, then I must have missed it. Number one and, was Sway, well, who I also publish. Yeah, I, I, I was looking at that list like, okay, well, here, today was either going to be, uh, you're going to be in a very good mood, or you're going to be real, like, more disgusted than usual. I mean, but, I, but, 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 I will say, there is a good way for us to promote translated literature now. Um, we should just do it with FanDuel. Like we should absolutely get the betting odds up on FanDuel, have people start have people start placing their bets on who's going to win. And once that money starts rolling in on that, I, I, I don't know. I actually think this might have some legitimacy to it. You can bet through William Tell, uh, and, but you have to VPN into the UK. Um, I don't know why there isn't more betting like that here. I wonder if there's like regulation. But like, yeah, absolutely. The people should be, we should just run our own bookie service. I don't think we use FanDuel. I think we, I think we create our own system whereby all the nerds can give us money and we are the bank then we are the casino, not the better. Um, we, we are, we are the FTX of the literary betting world. Yeah. Um, I mean, I love them. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm, a, I'm not a good con artist, but I'm a con artist. Um, no, I'm happy for the whole thing because we are involved with this. I mean, it's more of like, the problematics of like what logistics need to happen, how are we going to deal with the mm -hmm. books, what is going to happen, all that kind of stuff is the headache and the like talking to people sort of part. And we don't have the the two most recent books, Subtology and A Shining. So that's not as as relevant. But um the and I want to write a thing about this. Um that's that is part of like a larger project. All oh, that's kind of the concern. I do think too that this signals that Shen Sui wins next year. Hmm. You go from very like self not absorbed is the wrong term, but self like, like the self is very present, white male European next year, Chinese female, a little bit more experimental. Let's do this. Giddy up two in a row. That would be the goal. 
I, I'm um, greedy now. Um, here's a quick nuts and bolts question. Um, obviously, like if there's a run on the titles, you then have to get them, you know, reprinted quickly. Uh, potentially get a sticker on there about Nobel Prize Definitely. winner, that sort of thing. Um, there aren't that many printers left in the U.S. So, is there? And I mean, and I, I think I know the answer to this, but I'm just going to throw this idea out there. Around this time of year, is there like, could there be a hold placed? at a couple of the printers to allow for whoever wins to quickly, to like jump the queue, to quickly print. We, we did get quotes for uh, five, 10 and 15,000 copies of Shen Sui's books uh, earlier this week, because I was contacted by Reuters asking for like video footage of her and all this information. Cause if the, whoever the right. reporter was, was sort of assigned her. And if she won there, like for her, like potential victory, like we, they want all this stuff in place so that they can roll it out first thing. So we had already gone through, like I'd given them all the, the stuff that they needed. Um, and then we had gotten the quotes because, you know, it was set up like that. Like if, if this, if that were to happen, we could have flipped the switch for her immediately. Um, with the FOSA, one of the good things is that the books are, several of them are in LSI, which can print them very quickly. Okay. And so that, so the, the stock can be very, can be very quickly available for three of the books and for all the others, they would take a little bit longer, but not necessarily that much longer. Um, so yeah, so that's there and logistically, although there's like all sorts of other back end machinations that would be going on and that, that are happening. But, uh, I just had this like postmodernist like image of like kids in Africa getting the Nobel book that didn't win the Nobel, like Super Bowl shirts. Right, ready to go. And so they just donated to some poor kid somewhere. And they're like, here, we want you to have any books. They're like, what, what is this? <laughs> like, prize. <laughs> you big sticker on the front, but prize is misspelled. Yeah. How, how, <laughs> many, how, many, uh, no, how many Nobel laureates does uh, does Dalkey have at this point? I think it's four, but I'm, I'd have to think. You should make that shirt with like the their name and and like that whole deal, and then leave a blank and at the end. The one that I like, the version of that shirt that I like the best right now. This is super nerdy, and it ties into Mulligan Sue to shift gears here. Uh, to use a proper metaphor, is the baseball shirts that have the start the starting lineup or a certain number of names from the the team, and then highlights down the middle of the shirt letters that spell out like for the Seattle Mariners it has their names and highlights one letter in each name that spells out chaos ball and I'm like motherfucking want that like I've become a, a Mariners fan just for that graphic alone I've, I've seen some other ones but that would be really cool too if we had enough of them <laughs> to like spell out like fuck you or like something like really really delky centric yeah TL semicolon uh <laughs> DR. <laughs> all their names, these important authors, too long didn't read. <laughs> that would be great. Read. But baseball, baseball is the core. Baseball is the core concept of today's podcast, by the way. Speaking of too long didn't read, what about Mulligan Stew? Yeah, so we are at, so Lamont, just to recap for anyone who has been has been listening or hasn't been listening and needs a refresher, Anthony Lamont, Lamont is writing a book, Guinea Rad. It is bad. His characters within it. Um, Helpin and Ned Beaumont are freeing themselves from the confines of his of his book because they're made to do crazy ass shit that they don't appreciate and don't like and think that he's a total hack. They have found a town outside of the cabin where they are stuck, where Cl like Clive Salas from Ulysses exists, along with other people who have like escaped from their works and abandoned their role as as functioning as characters. Um, and uh, Lamont is also like, aside from like the bits that he writes and you get to read his chapters of his developing work in progress, also is writing a lot of letters, mainly to Professor Roach, who is going to, was going to like use one of his books in his class and has backed away from that. He's also writing letters to his sister. And then today he writes a letter to Lorna Flambeau, a young poet whom he meets. And he includes in this section that we read today, there are really just three parts. There is uh, Flambeau's collection of poetry, The Sweat of Love. There is um, a letter from Helpin or a, a journal entry from Helpin about what he discovers in the town. And then what he discovers in the town, which is the flawless play restored, The Mask of Fungo, which we'll talk about probably in length, even though it's the most confusing of all sections. And then there's one last little bit where there's a letter from Lamont to Sheila or to Lorna Flambeau in which uh, he goes full creep, pure creep, top creep, creep number one, all the way. Uh, 
Canceled, canceled, canceled. He was he he was full creep in that first letter. Like he's full creep in the first letter, but the second one is oh boy. Uh, I mean, he 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 stopped pussyfooting around. He just came right out with it in the second letter. But the first letter, if you have if you have any ability to read between the lines, like it is just pure hornball bullshit. Like oh, yeah. yeah. It's one thousand. I can't. I'm trying to find. Go back and find where it is. But uh, but yeah, it is. It is definitely that. Um, and this one will goes further. Let's start with Flambeau then, and do her parts, and then we can do the mask because the mask requires a lot of heavy, a little bit, bit of heavy lifting, but then a lot of enjoyment. And I can give you guys a rubric that I have uh, researched and found to like better understand it. But the sweat of love is like really shitty erotic poetry. And that, that I think should be declaimed in the worst poetic voice possible. And I wish and I hope that you guys are game for this. I think you should each read one of your favorite poems from here. Perform it. If not, I'm performing I swoon. <laughs> or, or to make Tom extra uncomfortable. Uh, what was the other one that I was looking at? Um, yeah, that was that was kind of the best. Maybe, maybe the slippery flesh. The titles of these are wonderful. No, I, think, I, I think I think homage is pretty great. Homage is real. You read it, bud. Homage. Right. Homage. These things I offered to the great god Eros. My wet and greeny gash and its attendant furs. My pruny anus hidden yet all unashamed. My ears that long to hear him whisper, hump me. <laughs> my nose that I may sniff his ruddy flesh. My eyes that he may spew his seed on them. My mouth that aches to gorge upon his prong. All, all my apertures are his. I will never be able to read the word or hear the word aperture again and not wince. Like, for Christ's sakes. <laughs> hump me. Hump me is so beautiful. Like any other term would have been, would have made it, wouldn't have worked as all. Hump me. Hump me. Oh, I mean, there, there, there is an absolute artistry to how bad these poems are. Like it's, it's really, he doesn't miss a trick in pushing them in every possible direction of just absurdity and crappiness. It, like it's as someone, as someone who has only done two readings in their life and once totally in character, I was supposed to read a poem to open up a, a, a conference here. Um, in Rochester a couple weeks ago, but I wasn't able to do it. I was in town, but I considered going in full like costume acting uh, mode and read one of these as, to kick off the whole conference and just do it. Just no, just completely straight and just walk out. <laughs> See what Fundraising conference is like, I suck <laughs> or adorable legs. Are, 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 aren't, you, aren't you so glad to see what your money is going towards, folks? This is this is. Hey, I didn't think that wasn't getting any money, and we don't get any money from this organization. Mm -hmm. I was just asked to be there. Well, it's like, like this section is the same joke that he's doing with the detective novel, right? Where it's like everything you can do to do bad writing, let's let's do it in a kind of earnest way, but enough pushed enough into absurdity where you realize it's just horseshit, right? So there's a really, uh, yeah, you said, you read your one, and I have a really interesting thing to share. Well, I don't necessarily have, like, I'll, I'll read something, but, like, I don't really have one that I actually want to read, but I just, just, like, lovely things where, like, you know, as the poet, like, the sound, like, oh, alliteration is really important to poetry, so on hot bodies, you get gorgeous guck of love, like, gorgeous guck, like, just disgusting, awful, thuddy, Green terrible... Dash. It's like a fucking meatloaf falling on the floor. Like this, like that's like the sound of this shit, right? Like, oh my god! <laughs> like, you know, like like you read pomegranates of wondrous Greece, oranges of sultry Florida, and peaches of sleepy Georgia. Like, what the? What is this? I yearn. Just the word yearn, right? Like that's a you know, you know I yearn to fuck. I yearn to fuck. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's so funny. The slippery fresh also like. How slick and juicy is your body, dearest, when all covered with your juices mail? Like all these like weird like body positivity, but in like this off way. But that one ends with maybe the best three lines of all poetry ever. Oh, let your sex stand tall like a gallant sail. I'll act as if I'm in a deli. To feast upon your hot pastrami is my goal. 
Which I wrote in the, the margin there, there's this uh, artist that's blowing up right now named Ice Spice, and she has a she has a uh, song called Deli, which you guys should oh, watch shit. about shaking her stuff like it's a deli, like in a deli. So, uh, Is this I another know, Isaac's favorite? Uh, producers of Ice Spice have read Slippery Flesh and were inspired by that to, to make the hit Deli. So like, like how, good is jungle, how good is Jungle Love, like to E.E. E. Cummings? And you just look at this super yeah. experimental, you know, uh, 1910 poetry here that they're going to just ex it's exploring on the page, you know. Well, and, and then and then after that, you have uh, Summer Fuck, a dramatic <laughs> eclogue, which actually what's what's even wilder about this is that as terrible as it is, it actually has to some degree more internal coherence than the mask that we're about to read, um, which is a wild statement. I don't know. <laughs> that's kind of a, that's kind of bizarre. This, well, this line by by Eros, the summer fuck. Ah, uh, ah, uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> the, the joy, the joy that you must have had typing these up. Like I can only oh. imagine. Just Smiling I, and this. It's, you know, so to have to, if you're writing this, you have to be cracking your ass up constantly. A lot of fun. And then thinking, fun. like, where does, like, one of the, there's there's something I want to say in relation to that. Like, one of the things that comes clear in here, and I don't want to jump ahead, but like, uh, all the references to Latvia that are in this book is so weird. Like, as if there's like some like inside joke that that meant something to, someone like that he was writing with or talking that was a friend like where it'd be like that's our shorthand joke for something else because it's random because there is no latvian country when this is written they're part of the ussr so you're picking like a satellite state to like be like the reference to this imaginary unbelievable country of latvia it's very weird but one thing that you mentioned brian is that you um uh say like this pushes it's bad writing that pushes it to that edge and it relates i think to like how this book is received. We talked about like the Flaubert-ness of it, where you have to know how to read the irony. Like irony and parody only work if you're aware that they are being ironic or parody, the things being parodied. If you read this straight and think that these are legit poems, then what the this book would make less sense than it possibly can. And here's an a interview with him. So um, this is from a 1994 interview about Mulligan Stew. Uh, I don't know who asked this question, the name of the person, but Mulligan Stew is a parody of several literary cultures. Can this process have any meaning for readers who don't understand what's going on before their eyes? Can this sort of book still be written today? And Gilbert Sorrentino, a parody only works if the reader or viewer is aware of the model that is being parodied. Sure, a book like this can be written today, but since there seem to be fewer readers, there will be fewer people who get the parody. Literature feeds on itself and people have to learn to read if they want to be readers. You can only learn to read by reading, but you can only read, but you can read only if you've learned how. Which I think ties into that idea of like, you can't really read this book without knowing how to read that, the parody and the poetry and the, and this is where the mask, that's, this is in that quote, that thing is in this issue of the review of contemporary fiction, which is in de dedicated entirely to Mulligan Stew. And this is an, in an essay specifically about the mask of fungo, which is where I can get a lot of information to frame this um, and sort of explain it. But I mean, to tie off the Lorna Flambeau, like what a name, like that's the perfect Sorrentino thing too, Lorna Flambeau, <laughs> like, like what a crazy sort of fiery uh, name. His letter to her, is maybe like the place that we should we should we should at least comment on in which it is the cringiest thing ever so he goes to well, dinner with her well part of the joke though too has to be um you know as you know air quotes if you can't see as smart as lamont is like he knows this is terrible and he knows this is bad he has to like he's he's read like you have to know it's bad right no he knows it's bad and he thinks that this is like I mean, so it opens before we read the poems, it opens with a letter to Flambeau where he's basically praising her to a certain degree, encourages her not to get it published, but to like self-publish and then hand it away, give it away for free to get your name out there, all that, and that we should have dinner sometime. And, but it's clearly like, I think he's reading as an, as an invitation to it's, have, it's, to have sex. Yeah, like, yeah, exactly. Yeah. This, and, and then, but then the, letter that he writes after they meet the second one praising it so much that's what is I mean. even more of a like 
shouldn't we be having sex now? Sort of, I mean, like literally that's what oh. he seems to be, it seems to be coming across. Like he, it sounds like he practically throws himself at, on her. Well, I then, think it goes beyond that. I think it goes yeah. beyond like the it goes beyond like the the sort of dirty old man situation. Like anyone reading this today will read this line. I know that you took it as a good joke. My attempt to force you into a cab and thus to my stu studio. Writers often like to parody in their rough way the absurd manners of the bourgeois world they never made. I know your laughter is genuine and warm. Like it's like very clearly like, and then he's like, this was a test. It's a it's a face I often present my persona of being forward and crude bohemian. I'm sure you saw through that my persona in seconds. Of course you did. It is a face that I often present to women, particularly women artists, to test their maturity and individualism. You passed the test. And may I say, passed it with flying colors. And then he's like, I would be pleased to read. <laughs> he's like, uh, my greatest regret is that I did not have the great pleasure of hearing you read The Sweat of Love in the friendly confines of my own poor studio. Like it's it, like him trying to force her into a cab is like, like borderline, if not direct assault. Like it is, it, it's, it goes when you, knock, like, when you knock me into the gutter and rode off in the ca in the cab alone, I almost cried out my delight in your perceptions. Marvelous. And then like the last, like he closes with, so dear lady, if you feel that you would enjoy a good literary evening of talk and food and drink, please come. Let me know when it would be most convenient for you. All right. I entertain very informally. So you might wish to bring along something comfortable into which you can change after dinner. Like take the fucking hint, dude. Like, <laughs> my God, this is. Ugh. There's a, my, one of my favorite lines within this though is where he's like he's like you should you should come and read to me in in person. Also, where is it here? He's like uh uh where he's like I'll also be pleased to read you. From I'll, I'll, also, I'll also be pleased to read to you. It's the best line. But there's <laughs> no a no from the novel on which I've been at work for the last few months. It is not a run of the mill narrative, and I would be extremely interested in getting the opinion of a poet who is also a woman about it. I feel somehow that only a woman poet can truly appreciate its rather veiled illusions and evocations. Like uh, also, uh, I entertain it very informally, so you might wish to bring along <laughs> something comfortable into which you can change after dinner. Like, oh my god. <laughs> There's like this is the cringiest. Like you could post this as like a, like a, a one of those like joke Tinder sort of things. Like uh, maybe yeah, no. any, a, 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 any... am I the am I the asshole? Am, am I the asshole when I try to force the woman in, into the cab and she kicks me to the gutter and then send her a follow up letter asking her to come over to my place? Like so yeah, this yes. is clearly like obviously decades before me too, before like bad men and publishing and stuff. Like how lecherous and bad is the publishing world? that this is what he's parry that like the joke is this like how yeah. frequently did this happen how often Whoa. did this happen dude how, I, I mean, how normal is this behavior so there's that book hot house yes. about fsg um that has a bunch of this that there was yeah. like that was basically like yeah like an open open secret of people like within the company and within like the relationship between like the editor and author whomever like definitely like going at it when, well, it's, when like the sick, it's like the sick cliche joke in hollywood like you have to blow the producer to get your job or like to get it and then it you know are and, we surprised when it comes out that this is all true and horrible and disgusting and lecherous and and yeah right and like publishing quid pro quos is weird because it's like not a profitable thing but there is something to like the power dynamics that like when you go to like if you go to like awp as like an editor there's like endless like places where that would could be exploited of people that are desperate for you to read them or whatever. I just make people buy me my buy me beer because I'm a pure alcoholic, but I don't I don't do any sexual sexual things wrong. I just like, you know, take their money and their their liquids and then uh and then not read their manuscripts. Let's 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 not say take their liquids again <laughs> and that please <laughs> Liquids and apertures. No more of that for the rest of the talk, please. For the no. rest of for the rest of time, no more. I still I laugh every time this joke about read my manuscript. Like, just do you want to read what I'm working? No, no. Well, I'd like to send you the first four chapters. If ever in every section, Lamont is like asking somebody to read his work, and that's, I, that's like the vehicle for us to read this shitty novel. I was making a joke, but it's not a joke. But I was making a joke about how every morning I can wake up and there are certain things I'm guaranteed. And one is that I can open my email and there will be an email from someone asking me to read, pitching their manuscript and asking me to read their manuscript. And there will be at least two or three other emails in which it's someone who did that and blindly sent me something asking me why I haven't gotten to reading their manuscript and replying yet, <laughs> which is like, 
<laughs> so it's not just like, will you read this? I'm like, no, that's why I didn't reply. They're like, why haven't you? Where's your response? It's been three weeks. Like, really? Like you, <laughs> I didn't ask you. <laughs> Authors. All right, so give us a hand with this ma this uh, mask. So mask. the mask, because the bookends of it make total sense. It's easy to get. It's fun. We're having. It's all fun and games. And then we get to just fucking Looney Tunes here for you know forty pages. <laughs> yeah. So a mask is. I'll just read this too from here because it is. It is. Uh, it is helpful if you're not familiar with. And there is like a long history to this. So. Uh, da -da -da. Okay, Sorrentino's work explicitly came. So first of all, this was published in 74 as part of a novel in progress and then appears in here five years later when Mulligan Stew comes out. So it did exist separately um, as a parody of the form. Sorrentino's work explicitly claims to be a mask, a historically obsolete mixed dramatic form usually associated with high festive occasions, often allegorical in character and intended to praise and amuse the wealthy and powerful. And the setup that this is from a uh, article by Tyrus Miller in this issue of the review of contemporary fiction, that's like pitiless flaws restored, satiric truth in Gilbert Sorrentino's flawless play restored, the mask of fungo. And um, part of the, the deal that, that you're talking about, Brian, this is gonna be a little academic, but this sort of sets up um, a part of it. So flawless play restored remains flawed by its removal from any real context in which it could be meaningful. And hence any reconciliation of conflicts and contradictions it seems to offer remains only a false ideal, um, ludicrously contrived in a novelistic universe that does not admit the idyllic except under the ironic sign, ironic sign of its impossibility. The festive and expressive function of Sorrentino's mask thus remains essentially unrestorable for reasons that the plane's own con play's own content, a contrived air set populism suggests. So within this, like the masks were sort of coming out of that, um, like the pageants and like the that sort of moment in like the 1500s of writing of like the the Christian allegories, the re restoration of things, the like things have gotten broken and now they can be fixed. Thanks to like the Lord, thanks to Jesus, that sort of vibe. But also we're like wildly like large and designed to mix like the high and low and be performed for wealthy individuals. So it's like kind of a wild setup to begin with that he's parroting. And in here, um, what's posited by Tyrus Miller that makes this make sense is that our playground is baseball. First of all, like with this, this within the book is like the book always like, like we're talking about with the poems and everything, everything works because it's ironic. Like the true sincere good writing is like essentially impossible within here. The, like everything is, is, is bastardized or like changed in some way. So that it's like ironic and not capable of like that, that sort of like accomplishment that you think fiction is for like that teaching or like the whatever. And in this, he's supposed to restore things. So um, within the baseball, so here is what uh, the force, four phases that this Miller lays out in here. One, bad baseball in its pre-restored condition. Two, radical chic in the fashion of extremism. Three, nostalgia for an untroubled past and its tired and true wisdom. Four, good baseball is flawless play restored. So our main character in here is Foots Fungo, who's batting two, I guess is how you would say it, 0 0.002, and has 32 errors by the beginning of May, or by May. So he's a bad fielder, a bad baseball player. He is broken. Um, and that is like the sort of template for this is that America is like the baseball field, or like culture as the baseball field is like a sort of populist uh, representation of society is not working because Foots Fungo, our hero, is not good. Um, and then you have all these funny, crazy shit with Susan B. Anthony wanting to get off constantly and like all this like sex and, and turmoil and like sort of like 60s, the 60s sort of like free love sort of thing dropped in there as like what's going on. And then in the play, the turn is that Fungo gets meets uh, the minuscule figurine of Ty Cobb, who gives him the worst and craziest advice possible, but also like harkens back to like baseball and life were better back in the time when there weren't blacks and there weren't Jews and there weren't these people screwing up our game. That was the pure, pure sense of things. And what gets restored then is that Fungo is good. Everyone thinks of him as a hero and wants to hump him as if then baseball becomes, makes things good again. But by, by hearkening back or like looking back towards this like racist, horrible era, 
uh, what's restored is not positive either. So like the 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 play doesn't the mass doesn't work on on it. It works on its own terms, but it works on its own terms against and as a parody of what a mask would be because it does not have that good ending that is like we all go into the glory of the light. Keep your eye on the ball. And so his speech, in, <laughs> I, and I don't. I think there's a part that I can't read out loud, but uh, his speech is wild. Um, which if you're not a baseball aficionado, that's okay. But uh, Ty Cobb is one of the greatest baseball players ever and probably the most racist, awful person ever simultaneously. Oh, he is both of those things. So the minuscule figure of Ty Cobb, who uh, before he comes to the bat, or before, before he goes to talk to Fungo and explain his wisdom, um, there's everyone in the, in the stands, all the maskers start singing songs that are like, he strides the mound with the latest disease. I want to get some wood on it so bad. <laughs> the sneaky slider made a rattler rider out of me. Um, <laughs> it's so good. It's so good. Um, and so then he comes up to talk to Fungo and he says, Fungo, you've been taking your eye off the ball halfway through your swing. I have noticed this in baseball heaven. And so I have returned to earth to caution you about it. Let's say a little bird told me, keep your eye everlastingly on the ball, Fungo, and the game will be as good to you as it was good to me despite the inclusion of Latinas and Negras and well, almost ruined it. Spikes high, stick it in his ear, put it in his teeth, no quarter, hit him where they ain't, run it out, wait for your pitch, break up the double play, no defense against the homer. <laughs> and then he fades away, farewell, Fungo, farewell. It is it is time to take the eternal field, farewell, I am the old pill, and like fades away. But that series of like, first he's like, gotta keep your eye on the ball, stay on the prize. You know, this baseball can save you and be good to you, even though it's been contaminated in the Thai cobwebs um, with uh, quotes around that and then gives him like a series of dumb cliches that are like that are baked into baseball but are dumbass cliches like hit it where they ain't like okay thanks for the tautology coach um, that's sort of like then will be a hit <laughs> will have succeeded like this, they're dumb um, and it's it's kind of a wonderful thing and then he's suddenly like oh my god I was like I heard the voice of the old Georgia peach, going back to the Georgia peach of the poems, by the way, um, he told me to keep my eye on the ball. It is the secret. How simple it all seems now. Everything true and beautiful must converge. And then he's capable of like cranking a 410 foot Homer, which we all know. <laughs> is, is... Well, and, and not only does he do that, but the ball strikes a bearded homosexual and the crowd goes wild. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. So not only is so he is restoring what he's restoring is flawed and his flawless play of being able to like hit homers and field the ball and do all the, the correct baseball maneuvers is an attempt to restore something that is clearly not good. Um, and that if, if this if this baseball, this mask is the representation of society, it's like why? And it does. I mean, it rings true right now. There's so many people who are like you know, values of the 50, like the hashtag trad wife people and like everyone from the right, like this is all that, that sort of desire for the time when things were like that exists. Oh, the the pure middle days with the segregation and the, yeah. It's part of like a very toxic part of our culture that is also like very prevalent. Um, yeah. And, and so I think that this is sort of parodying that in that like Susan B. Anthony goes from being crazy to being like, I just want fungo, man. Like and and so it's it, it's pointing to a time that is flawed. And I, they know that Sorrentino knows that too. So it is it is crazy to read. There's a million characters that are not characters. There are lines that are just lines. It's like frantic. It's like it's literally like looking at like the spewings of someone who is like a genius with ADD, just like untethered for like forty pages. But it also does have that structure, and it is really funny. And it uses this really great technique that I particularly like of the recurrence of shit from Shinola um, is one of the threads through here of like, I don't know shit from Sh I don't know shit from Shinola, which also is part of Gravity's Rainbow, which is why it's like a phrase I absolutely love where they're just like, what is like, I don't know Shinola. <laughs> like, what is, what, do, what, why would I know what shit from Shinola? And what does that even mean? But it ends, it even has like, uh, one of the, a couple of the characters, like there's the characters like goddamn broads don't know shit from Shinola about baseball, um, which is a uh, funny and also goes into that line. And then the one characters that always show up that are wealthy Texans are the most racist and horrible people possible within here. 
and they keep coming up and referencing things like that too. But yeah, the ship from Shinola line shows up so many times. Um, and I love how it like gets recontextualized as like the a, a running gag. So have you heard um there's a poem by Gregory Corso called Dream of a Baseball Star? It's yeah. published in like 1960. So uh obviously it's before this was written. Uh and I'm curious. I doubt it, but I'm curious if uh, he knew of his poem. It's pretty short. So I'll actually read you a real poem. Uh, it's called Dream of a Baseball Star. Uh, so instead of Ty Cobb, we get Ted Williams. Um, and if you don't know shit about shit, Ted Williams was a really good hitter for Boston. So I guess last person to hit 400 in a season. I dreamed Ted Williams leaning at night against the Eiffel Tower weeping. He was in uniform and his bat lay at his feet, knotted and twiggy. Randall Gerald says you're a poet, I cried. So do I. I say you're a poet. He picked up his bat with blown hands, stood there astraddle as he would in the batter's box, and laughed, flinging his schoolboy wrath towards some invisible pitcher's mound, wading the pitch all the way from heaven. It came, hundreds came, all afire. He swung and swung and swung and connected not one, sinker, curve, hook, or right down the middle. A hundred strikes. The umpire, dressed in strange attire, thundered his judgment. You're out! And the phantom crowd's horrific boo dispersed the gargoyles from Notre Dame. And I screamed in my dream, God, throw thy merciful pitch. Herald the crack of the bats. Hooray the sharp lighter to left. Yay, the double, the triple. Hosanna, the home run. But this, like, idea of baseball being broken and this, like, uh, like godly figure coming out and, like, putting it back into order again. Uh, it's just uh, to kill the dreams. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm curious if there's a, a riff or a play on that with this tie. You know, instead of Ted Williams being broken, you have you know Foots, whatever Foots fuckhead or whatever his name is, and uh, and then we get Ty Cobb coming down. Keep your eye on the ball, and you'll crack the homer. Bye bye, bye bye, bye bye. Just echoes off. <laughs> <laughs> and it is like this is also like playing off the Casey at the bat thing of like the hero isn't. <laughs> the hero but is kind of the hero there is like a bunch of references to um like fungo like when it's puts fungo all i think about is the the fun playing fungo like at baseball practice yeah. which is which is part of it but there's also like italian fango means mutter filth as if the whole thing is stuck in the mutter filth and which is unclear and unrestored um so there's like other other play with like that particular name but yeah i i think this right like you read it and it's like i remember proofing when i when we had to ocr this and i had to proof the the book like looking at every line of this is insane like i read every word and every line and had to frequently be looking at the original to make sure that the scan hadn't like invented a word because so many of these are invented or, or manipulations of like how you would say or pronounce or spell something and that's the, exactly the kind of thing that ocr wants to force into you know proper english so it was like a nightmare to work through, but now rereading it, like, and being able to like sort of skim or like pick and dive in and out with like a general idea of what the structure is and like whatever, it was, it, I found this incredibly fun and incredibly funny. And like the different asides, like the, like, I love the bit where the, I think it's, is, is it fucking whore? Is that what the name of the character yeah. is? Yeah. Fucking whore. Yeah. Fucking whore is like such repressed sexual attitudes are eroding the very fiber of the nation. My first love preferred his hand handkerchief to my uh uh, and now he is little more than a Chinese laundryman. There must be no restrictions on complete sexual expression. I stand before you as a horrible example of pre adolescent misinformation. And the Marquis de Sade, who's in this, just says, Lady has the right idea. <laughs> like the, the interplay between high and low and like, like, a real real sentiment and then like undercut like joyce james joyce who is uh is he a waiter what's his deal in here he's a I waiter in, at, i think he works at a pharmacy or something like that grocer's assistant he's yeah. a waiter in um and works at the hotel in the delkey archive but yeah and here he's a grocer's assistant and he pops <laughs> in every so often with these like <laughs> slightly morose odd lines that kind of reflect on what came before but not necessarily um so like the senator street uh, is complaining about things and he goes and dies and then james joyce the good go and the wicked is left over it's like this over serious strange line i that i love i love this like i think it's super fun it's crazy it's out of nowhere it could stand alone as it did it's like out of control and that out of control is so fun
But to sum up with one other, while well, you guys are looking at things, one other Shinola, I do love the kind of the end of the shit from Shinola uh, bit where Dr. Eliziar Saad, <laughs> my early findings seem to point to a similarity in the process of decay in fedoras and laboratories alike. Although it is too soon to be absolutely sure, they both appear to possess the identical molecular structure of Shinola. <laughs> Now I'm not positive on the uh, like the etymology of shit from Shinola is because I've heard two things like I know Shinola is a watch, but is it also a brown? Sh it's also a shoe polish, I think, right? That's what I thought, but I don't have. Um, a, I remember looking. At I'm curious what's the. Uh... It was the boot polish. Okay. Which which would make sense with the shit from Shinola if it's a brown if it's a browning material yeah. or just a shinier yeah you're rubbing shit on your shoes thinking it's yeah Got it. yeah <laughs> yeah and that's like that's where that is the that's double check but that is the origin of it okay. which yeah is is kind of perfect and it's fun because like you can use it day but like I don't know if Shinola still exists I don't know I don't know anyone who's like polishing their boots necessarily either but well uh, I mean, but it's it's also that like town and country divide you know yeah. like that the farmer's going to have shit on his shoes that's just how it works whereas the you know the sophisticate you know working the street is going to instead make sure his shoes you can see you know his perfect part in the reflection of his shoes you know so there, there's that as well which is clearly a part of what the the argument is here around the decay and baseballs restoration or lack thereof yeah yeah and there there I, this is i'm not on the page where jerry says a crazy thing the small group of wealthy texans are incredibly racist and can it be that snap crotches were in use in late 19th century latvia it might explain the preponderance of impotence in that ill-fated land beyond the sea <laughs> directly quoted to kaya in a text message as i read that wretched land <laughs> just toss that in there i still i'm curious if within his letters there's some there's some bit to this that's like more it just feels really random <laughs> like really really random i did find by the way I, I i don't have it open right now and i'd have to go back and find it but i found a letter from sorrentino to john that predates this book and predates the review contemporary fiction and is fascinating in relation to like the reception of of books and culture today and it opens let me i will, I will find it but it opens with a line um that's very interesting in terms of like where we are with like uh sorrentino in this book as a whole and the nature of um lamont uh hold on it's somewhere right here yeah, it's from September 1974. And this is like a private correspondence, but so I'm not going to read the whole thing. And it doesn't really have necessarily the whole, like a whole thing in it, like or anything that's like that personal. It's very, it becomes very like strange and ranty, but it opens with something that I really want to share with you, but my computer's not com complying. But basically, Sorrentino's like, your re literary reputation is suffering because of your you're being involved with me. Here it is. Dear Jack, this is from 27th of September, 1974. Dear Jack, I'm beginning to get the feeling that you are not welcome in the Middle West. I also suspect that your relationship to me and my work, however peripheral, is doing your career damage. I'm only half in jest when I say this. It is permissible to be interested in contemporary letters so long as you're interested in the right kind. The line runs from Henry Miller through Lawrence Durrell and thence to Barth Bartholomew Coover Pynchon down to our own peers. Sikonek, Brodigan, Kaczynski, et al. You are still safe with okay black folks like Ishreed and Leroy, but outside of those two, you're not too cool. <laughs> Which is interesting, but I like like the, uh, the, the beginning part of like your affiliation with me is harming your literary career. And you gotta think like, this is the thing that like John doesn't publish this, it comes out from Grove obviously, but he does start the review of contemporary fiction with a focus on Gilbert Sorrentino, becomes like his main publisher of all the reprints that go through Dalkey, publisher of new works through Dalkey, up until the point where they have a falling out over Red the Fiend. But like, it is like, it is tying yourself to a particular horse or a particular sort of, of literature that really is not ever been very well accepted. And that was kind of the Dalkey motto of like iconoclastically creating 
a new way of talking about literature that is against what everyone else is sort of doing. And FASA is that, to go back to like an example, and like is is unique at that moment in time in particular in terms of like that tone and atmospheric way that he writes and like the clip nature of trilogy and like that directness is goes back to an era that's not part of the contemporary one. It, it's, it's, it's out of time, which I can see why the Nobel Prize Committee prefers that. Um, but it also is interesting. It does to me relate to the overall Delkey mission of, of doing books like this, that you have to know how to read to read this in a way. And you can only know how to read if you've read. Yeah, I just write just write what you know. That's all you gotta do. It's just write self keep your eye on the ball, write what you know. You gotta be a good keep 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 your spikes up. Of course, that would be the advice from the ghost of Ty Cobb. Keep your spikes <laughs> up. The only but, time I ever got thrown out of a game uh was I broke up a, a no hitter and then the next player immediately grounded into like a ending ending double play and I came in spikes high and with a head full of steam and drilled the second baseman and uh got thrown out of the game and whipped my helmet at the ump and was suspended for multiple games as a result how my old were you like down 14. okay I was gonna say 34. <laughs> I was actually, I, I was going to say, I was going to say eight or 32 well, like, and, and nowhere in between. <laughs> Pony League, whatever Pony League is. Yeah, it's uh, around 14, I think. Yeah. 14, 15, yeah. Uh, anyways, it's great that baseball is in here, ties into our current state, and which I I, I guess I'll, I want to go first. My line of the week, uh, line of this section for sure, ties into what's going on in real life baseball in which Shotgun Dreama says, all the world's a ballpark, and in it, we poor players are the Blue Jays. Oh. <laughs> topical. Yep, topical. Uh, yeah. Four Blue Jays. I've got mine loaded, ready to go. Since uh, I live in the shadow of Mount Hope Cemetery, where our dear Susan B. Anthony is laid to rest, uh, I'm going to go with uh, Susan B. Anthony. Take off your skirts and lie down, darling. In a certain light, you bear an uncanny resemblance to Sappho, a uh, dynamite babe. <laughs> just, I loved how it was like, was it like four, three, four years ago? Like there was this like resurgence of Sappho and her uh, the poetry. Yeah. And like, I just, uh, a great, what a great reference. <laughs> my favorite, my best cat that I've ever had was named Sappho. It was a he, um, yeah. but Sappho was his name. And uh, he was the best cat. How dare you? I'm gonna be my cat. Didn't know that it was a boy, but he became like he was a very sexual cat and like had sex with another male cat in my co-op, which then alerted the woman whose cat was forcibly sodomized that he was a boy. She's like, Your cat's not a girl. I was like, Yeah, that's why his giant balls hanging down. Like it's not a question. Where where is this going? Where, what's happening? Here? I don't know. It's a Sappo reference. Sappo set me off in motion. It's like, <laughs> my Sappo is like also a little crazed. Cat testicles somehow. Cat Dear balls. Lord. This is um, just like Lost in the Donda. Yeah, well, we'll get to that in a second. I guess my, you know what? I've said my 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 favorite line of the week when I read the poem. Like clearly, <laughs> clearly has has to do with apertures, and I don't need to repeat it. But um, <laughs> thank you for sparing us. <laughs> yeah, Jesus. Now I will tell you there be very there will be very little talk of apertures on Lost in Redonda. So I mean there there is we got that going for us. I so I want you to explain that, but I'm gonna steal your line of, one more line of the week from you, which is God, I forgive all 320 hitters and flashy infielders. We can that's, all live by those words. That's that's very true. As a career, as a career 120 baseball hitter and uh flashy infielder. So yeah, okay. I get through. So tell us about your podcast. Uh, yeah, so it's um, I'm doing um, Lost in Redonda uh, with Lori Feathers, um, owner and buyer for Intera Bang Books in Dallas. Uh, it's basically weekly at this point. Um, the second season is going to drop. Uh, the first episode will drop tomorrow. But um, in the first season, we read through pretty much all of Javier Marias's fiction um, and interspersed that with backlist titles that one of us hadn't read um and we just kind of go in about the backlist um but yeah marius was the big the big through thread uh, the big project and that's where the name comes from the island of redonda that he was uh 
king of prior to his death. Um, and I guess Juan Gabriel Vasquez is the new king, or that's being rumored to to be about to happen, which is, I think, kind of neat um, and interesting and I think pretty good choice. Um, but this second season, uh, we will be reading through all of Muriel Spark. We're off to a great start um, and still doing our backlist selections. So episode one that'll be out tomorrow uh, features a open letter title, uh, Chronicle of the Murdered House. Um, then we do the Comforters, Sparks' first novel. And then the next episode actually features uh, Chad with oh, yeah. another open letter title, uh, The Conquerors, by another Norwegian. It's a Norway day. Um, I, and I'm, have we decided how you actually pronounce his name? Is it Sharstad? Sharstad. Yeah, Jan Sharstad. Um, but yeah, uh, we it's called Lost in Redonda. We'll be um, out every week uh, starting tomorrow. And uh, it's a it's a pretty good time. We dig in as pretty deep into whatever strikes us about these books. And uh, yeah, I think I think it's fun. That's why I'm still doing it. So hope folks will be up for checking it out. I'll, I'll put the link to it in the show notes, but it's available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts. Yeah, it's, it's 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 everywhere. So if you're interested, you have YouTube. no excuse. I don't know hmm? if people use. I don't know if people use Apple Podcasts still, or if they're all on Spotify, or all those other ones seem to have gone away. So, yeah, like uh, I can see the metrics of like where the biggest uptake is, and it's definitely Spotify and Apple. And Google is like less than a percentage point oh, right. at this point. I forget about Google Podcasts because I, yeah. I, I had to download that once. Well, because something. because Google has forgotten about Google Podcasts, I think at this point as well. So. True, true. Well, it's a great, it's a great podcast. The conversation that we had was very fun. I've listened to a few of them about Marias, especially the trilogy, which I particularly like, and that that those are all great. Um, and uh, everyone should tune in and and subscribe, listen, and follow them. Brian, do you have anything you want to plug or promote? Uh, no, but I just feel like this this section kind of reminds me of the Chicago Bears. Like, there's a lot of people involved, and it's just a giant mess. <laughs> Woo -hoo! Uh... I also think that it's funny to read a, a, a big section about baseball right after the Chicago Cubs pissed away their entire uh, possible postseason in like the last week. So, I mean, well, let's play know, not restored there. You, you know, you know, well, I mean, that's just the universe balancing itself. You know very well that I, I have no illusions about what the Cubs are or not. I, having said that, it is nice to at least have the possibility of a postseason versus uh, I don't know what, what, what did your when did your hopes fade June this year no, July I, I think it's, I think a specific there's a specific day actually um, in which they in uh, late May early June somewhere in there they come back they're only a few games under 500 few games out of first place. This is, this is this is the card. This is the Cardinals we're talking Cardinals, about. Yes. Just, just to really, make it explicitly clear who we're talking about here. Yeah, they had started off horribly. They have a big falling out. There's a lot of like discord. I love this shit. I don't care that they didn't win. It's it's way more fun to like now think about rebuilding and Mike managing a team. But like there is a moment in like late May, early June when they made a run and they were beating the Pirates, and then their bullpen gave up like eight runs over two innings, and that was the end of it. And that was the moment where like everything. Every hope, everything stopped right there, right then, and then they became terrible. And it's it, it's been a joy. Uh, th this might not win my podcast any listeners in the uh, greater St. Louis area, but I have family um, that lives near there. So when we visit them over the summer, um, you know, my in-laws tend to watch the evening news to see the weather, see what's going on. So it's all St. Louis news. And I have to tell you, I have not seen such depressed newscasters that when they throw to sports they they cringe they wince and it is the it is the shortest <laughs> sports segment you will ever encounter on a local news channel because all they had was the cardinals they pivoted so hard to that new mls team yeah, it was oh, no really shit. really incredible but, they, but but it was still so half-hearted they still were kind of like and now we go talk about st louis city they just like mutter under their breath about it. It's, yeah. It was, I, I, I will say it was delicious. I, I really enjoyed that quite a bit. Watching teams fall apart is wonderful. I have to say like, it's, yeah. I, I don't mind at all. So for next week, we're reading up through page 327 in the new edition and 277 in the old one. I don't know what those section entails. I haven't looked ahead, but we are about to get a 
so, so not a spoiler, but as a preview, we are about, about to get a big change um, is coming soon. I don't know if it's in the next section or not, but in relation to once Anthony Lamott changes the name, which is referenced, and I'm not giving anything away because it's in the reader's report prior to the book itself. When he changes the name of the book he's working on, shit gets hits like hyperspeed and becomes like a, a really different tone of a book in some ways. And we are like kind of at the cusp of the, the mask is the most like confusing and baffling part. It's about to turn into like the most like blistering, sar sarcastic and like spite filled book that you can read. <laughs> Go Diamondbacks or D-backs, D-backs, D-backs. That's a fun word to say. I love them. They're my new team. I don't want to be.